citizens' rights was the first part of the withdrawal agreement, which is really the, the international treaty that covers arrangements for the UK's exit from the EU. So it was the first part of the withdrawal agreement to be discussed and also to be settled back in December last year. And the reason that that was covered first was because everyone thinks it's so important. And that's really for basic reasons of fairness that you all made your decision to live your lives as British nationals here in Slovenia at a time when the UK was a member of the EU. And I think there was general agreement that we should all try to provide as much continuity as possible for people like yourselves, but also for EU nationals who made their home in the UK um, before we had a referendum and decision on, on Brexit. Um, it's been quite an interesting day actually today and there have been quite a few decisive um, developments or decisive step forwards I think um, in recent weeks um, and Theresa May um, spoke publicly this afternoon and explained that the UK has now agreed with the European Commission both the text of the withdrawal agreement so as I was saying that's the treaty that covers arrangements for the UK's exit from the EU but also to Today, the text of a political declaration, which is a different sort of thing, that's really about the future relationship. It sets the ambition and scope of the future relationship that the UK and the EU want to have together, and, that will, and the detail of that will still be negotiated. So both of those things have now been agreed between the UK and the European Commission, but there will be a European Council this weekend when all European leaders, so Prime Minister Sharetz for Slovenia and Theresa May for the UK, uh, will be meeting in Brussels to consider both of those, um, both of those agreements, the withdrawal agreement and the political de declaration. Um, if, as I hope, those are agreed by all EU member states, then we move on to the ratification process. So there will be a vote in Parliament in the UK before Christmas, and that will start the ratification process in the UK. Um, and then there will also be ratification in the European um, Parliament after that. Um, try and explain a little bit about the, the withdrawal agreement. So the part of the withdrawal agreement that is relevant to you is, is about citizens' rights. And really what it does is it protects the rights of UK nationals in the EU and EU citizens in the UK to continue living your lives broadly as you do now. That's, that's the essence of it. The withdrawal agreement also covers some other issues, for instance the financial settlement, which is about the UK settling its obligations as a parting member state in a fair way, also covers Northern Ireland to ensure that there's no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And it also sets out the terms of something we call the implementation period, which is basically the period from when the UK leaves at the end of March next year until the end of 2020, which is the time when we really put the bones, uh, the meat on the bones of the political declaration and really agree the detail of the future relationship. And during that period, the idea is that there is absolute continuity for citizens and for businesses. So the UK remains part of the single market and all of the current arrangements remain as they are now. Um, and then the political de declaration, I've, I think I've already explained, but really that um, sets the scope of the, of the future partnership. So it covers trade, it covers security, um, and, and really sets our, our goals in, in those areas. People who are eligible under the withdrawal agreement are all UK nationals and their family members who are lawfully residing in the EU at the end of the implementation period, or also EU citizens who are lawfully residing in the UK um, at that time. Um, so we, as I was saying, have been working closely and thinking with Nina and her team about um, how this would be implemented here. And we have been developing um, this table here, um, which I... So this table here, which I think we've left you all a, a copy of on your chairs, which really works through the withdrawal agreement and the different areas covered in that to consider um, how that would work um, here in um, Slovenia. 
So I'm just going to run through in really high level terms some of the, the headline provisions in there. And then um, Nina can say a bit more. We'll have some time for questions. And um, you can ask us all as a panel any questions. And anything we don't get a chance to cover now, come and find one of us over some food and drink and you can chat to us about it then. <laughs> So the first point that I think is um, relevant is we've asked, been asked quite a lot about when uh, we've been having, having smaller gatherings around Slovenia is about um, temporary residents. And um, what we've confirmed is that temporary residents can continue to be rolled over um, post-Brexit. Um, secondly, that you can continue to work here under the, the same employment rights as before continue to receive social assistance as a permanent and in some, te some cases a temporary resident as now. Um, it's still compulsory to obtain Slovene national health insurance and that will continue to grant you access to primary health care. Fifthly, your close family members will continue to enjoy the rights that you do. Access to education in Slovenia will remain the same and access to UK pensions will remain the same and the British government will continue to uprate pensions. One, uh, one element that isn't covered in the withdrawal deal and is part of the ongoing, or the, will be part of the next phase of negotiations, covers, covers onward freedom of movement. And I know that is important to uh, too many people here. So just to be clear, that is now being rolled into the next phase of negotiations. So that hasn't been settled as um, part of the um, withdrawal agreement. Um, I'm going to hand over in a, in a minute to um, Nina, um, but to anticipate a question that I'm sure you'll ask me, you know, what about no deal? What if, what if this doesn't happen? What if this doesn't come off? And I, and I think in that scenario, our goal will still be to work very, very closely with the Slovene government to provide as much continuity as possible. So Theresa May has said that in that scenario, if that were to happen, then the UK government would protect the rights of EU nationals who've made their homes in the UK, who were lawfully resident in the UK. And in that scenario, we would be working together again to ensure as much continuity as possible and to ensure reciprocity. I'm in the Department for Exiting the European Union in London, and my team is responsible for citizens' rights and migration in Brexit. Um, so I kind of see that as it's three groups of people, so to speak. So the first group, which is the Euro cohort, which is the people that have moved before exit and have made their lives in the EU, or vice versa, EU citizens that live in the UK. Um, and as the Ambassador Nina spoke about, we've already agreed a deal on the withdrawal agreement. Um, which will secure your rights so you can go on living your lives broadly as you do now. Um, the second group of people that my team was responsible for, is responsible for was those that moved during the implementation period. So when we talk about the implementation period, that's the period from exit day until the 31st of December 2020. Um, and during that period, everything will remain the same. EU law will continue to apply, which means the free movement rules will continue to apply. Um, so we have already agreed under withdrawal agreement again that the citizens' rights aspect of the withdrawal agreement and the rights that are enshrined in that will apply to those that move um, until the 31st of December 2020. Uh, so that's, that's rolled into one group now. Um, and the second group that my um, team does the policy work for is for the future relationship. So it's what we call the future mobility framework and it's the next phase of negotiations and what our relationship with the EU will look like with regards to the movement of people after the 31st of December 2020. Um, so quite a lot, as I'm sure you can imagine. And within that, my role is I lead on engagement. So I do lots of events like this across the EU, talking to groups of UK nationals. And as I said, really trying to reassure you on your rights going forward. Um, and also vice versa, I go around the UK and talk to EU citizens in the UK and doing the same thing because um, it's a reciprocal agreement. So the rights are the same for both UK nationals in the EU and EU citizens in the UK. Um, so I just want to thank you for coming tonight. I really, we really do value the, this. I really value this opportunity to talk directly to you. Um, I think. Uh, the only thing I would just like to reiterate, which is what the ambassador said, is today's been a very, very busy day for my department. I, I got on the on plane and then got off and we had a deal and a political declaration, all agreed. So um, just to say that is, 
it's our, as Nina said, uh, from the Slovenian government side, our government says we very much believe this deal, uh, the withdrawal agreement text and the political declaration is the best for both parties. And we are very much working towards a deal scenario. We, we do not anticipate a no deal scenario. And this has been a very decisive step forward in the past few days at delivering this deal. Um, and as Vassar said, the next step is it goes to the European Council on Sunday and then there'll be a vote in our parliament before Christmas. Um, so I just, I'll finish there because I said I would like to move on to questions, but, um, and I just, I guess just to reiterate that your lives will remain broadly the same and your rights will be protected in international law once we leave um, the EU.